everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Google began 24 years ago with a big mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. AI has been an important way we approach our mission. In 2001, we were using a simple version of machine learning to suggest better spellings on search. And by 2011, deep learning techniques were helping pave the way for things like better speech recognition and more accurate maps. A decade later, AI powers so many of the products people use every day, from search and translate to searchable photo albums and cameras that represent a wider range of skin tones. And Google Cloud brings advanced AI capabilities to organizations, helping them innovate and grow their business. At the same time, we are seeing how AI is helping with disaster relief, healthcare, education, the arts, and more. We see so much opportunity ahead and are committed to making sure the technology is built in service of helping people. Like any transformational technology, AI comes with risks and challenges. That's why Google is focused on responsible AI from the beginning, publishing AI principles which prioritize the safety and privacy of people above anything else. Today, we'll share more about our progress as well as early research that shows you where we are headed. AI is the most profound technology we are working on, yet we are still in early days. Very much looking forward to working with experts and partners in the years ahead to make sure everyone benefits from the opportunities it creates. With that, I want to say thank you for being here. Hope you all enjoy the event. I'll turn it over to Jeff now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and welcome to AI At. We've made tremendous advances in the field of AI over the last decade, so that computers can now essentially see, hear, and understand the world around them. And AI is really essential to deliver on Google's mission. So the team that I lead, Google Research, serves that mission by solving fundamental problems in science engineering, particularly in artificial intelligence these days. And we're excited that Google is on the leading edge of AI, not just on the technical side, but also in figuring out how to responsibly deploy it in ways that help people around the world. That means deploying AI in our products from Google Search to Pixel Phones and many others, to Google Cloud to help other enterprises use AI in solving their problems, and working to advance many fields of science and other human endeavors. You'll hear announcements today in three different areas. First, in AI for social good, we've been doing a lot of work on how can we use AI for things like climate adaptation? Second, using AI to help unlock human creativity. And third, in using AI to make technology accessible in many more languages in our AI for language inclusivity work. We'll also discuss what we learned about the various challenges and risks that AI poses as an emerging technology and talk about how our AI principles that we introduced in 2018 guide our work to make sure our technologies help individuals and benefit society overall. And we'll talk about why getting AI right needs to be a collective effort involving not just researchers, but domain experts, developers, community members, businesses, governments, and citizens. Progress in AI might feel especially fast right now, but this has actually been many, many years in the making. I was first introduced to neural networks as a very excited undergrad in 1990. I did my senior thesis on using parallel computation to train neural networks. At that time, neural networks could solve really interesting but toy-sized problems. So I thought if we could use the 32 processor parallel computer in the department, we could get neural networks to do really impressive things with 32 times as much compute power. I was way off. It turns out we needed about a million times as much computational power before neural networks could actually scale to real-world problems. But now we have that computation power, and neural networks are doing really impressive things. Today's event is about a hopeful vision for the future. We want to reimagine how technology can be helpful in people's lives. I'm sorry I can't be with all of you in person, but please enjoy all the new things you'll see today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Chow, Senior Director of Research and Innovation at Google. I've always cared deeply about society's well-being and believe technology done well can create positive change. 
I've seen this firsthand being a part of a group in Kenya called Lewa. Lewa supports community conservancy, helping people with healthcare, education, their environment, and wildlife. Here's a picture of me and an orphan rhino uh, in Kenya. Technology done right and in partnership with the local communities can advance causes like this. Today I'd like to share how Google Research is using AI to make progress on some of humanity's biggest challenges. One effort that we're proud to announce is expansion of our flood forecasting initiative. Floods claim tens of thousands of lives and create billions of dollars in damages around the world every year. Their impacts are particularly severe for individuals in low resource regions, which often lack effective early warning systems. Accurate accessible forecasting has the potential to decrease fatalities and economic damages by 30 to 50%. Last year, we sent 115 million fl flood notifications to 23 million people in India and Bangladesh, directing them to flood alerts over Google search and maps. Initial research by the Yale Economic Growth Center, supported by Google.org, found that our notifications tripled the number of people who received flood alerts and quadrupled the number of protective actions taken. Today, I'm excited to announce the expansion of our flood alert coverage to 18 new countries, including Brazil, Colombia, Sri Lanka, and 15 African countries, including Chad, Nigeria, Republic of Congo, and South Africa. Our team is also addressing wildfires, which have been increasing in recent decades and are expected to worsen in the coming years due to climate change. Every year, wildfires cause billions of dollars in damages and produce over seven gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions. Our machine learning models, trained using satellite imagery, allow us to identify and track wildfires in real time and predict how they will spread, enabling us to support firefighters and other first responders. Today, we're proud to announce our wildfire detection system in US, Canada, Mexico, and other parts of Australia. Beyond disaster tracking and prediction, we are happy to announce that our technology supports post-disaster relief as well. In collaboration with the UN World Food Program, we developed a machine learning tool that analyzes satellite imagery to identify damaged buildings after disasters. This tool gives crisis responders crucial information about the most heavily hit areas in the first days of the response effort. Following Hurricane Ian, our technology evaluated over 400,000 buildings and identified 69,000 damaged buildings. This allowed the charity Give Directly to deliver $2 million to more than 2,900 low-income families living in heavily impacted areas, starting within a week of the landfall. We used the same technology to support government relief efforts during recent flooding in Pakistan. We hope to continue to empower organizations to deliver aid faster to those who need it most. In addition to tackling environmental challenges, we're also using AI to advance the frontiers of medicine and give people critical health insights, even when access to care is limited. One of our research projects aims to improve maternal survival rates in regions without ultrasound sonographers. We have partnered with Northwestern Medicine to develop AI that assists nurses and midwives to easily collect and interpret ultrasound images. Our AI tool has the ability to determine fetal position and gestational age, critical for helping healthcare workers identify issues early in pregnancy. Importantly, this technology can run on device, on low cost devices without connectivity, making it useful in regions with limited infrastructure. We're also driving the future of health AI applications on consumer phones. One of our longest standing efforts is diabetic retinopathy, a leading cause of preventable blindness worldwide. Working with public health agencies, we've reached more than 150,000 patients using ARDA, or Automated Retinal Disease Assessment. In the past year alone, we've doubled our screenings. We're now evolving this technology to work with a photo of an eye taken on a consumer phone. This will unlock screening for anybody who has a smartphone with a camera. Our advances in computer vision are also enabling phones to become powerful means for triaging care by detecting vital signs like heart rate and respiratory rate. These tools are now being used by hundreds of thousands of Android users, and in the past month, we've expanded our capabilities to detect sleep disruptors like coughing and snoring. This marks the first time people will have easy access to longitudinal information about their respiratory health. We still have many challenges to address if we're going to improve the overall well-being and that of our planet. Imagine I hope this helps you imagine the potential of AI creating a better future. We look forward to sharing even more advances with you next time. 
I will now pass it to Doug, who will talk about our work in generative AI. Thanks again, Kat. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Doug. I lead a research team at Google focused on generative AI. Uh, that's a class of models unlocking creative agency. I've been doing this for a long time. In my 25 years in this career, I've never seen quite so many advances in the generative space as I've seen in the last few months. Uh, the pace of innovation is truly incredible. So today, I'd like to take the chance to show you some of our research. All through history, Technology has been used to express ourselves. We have the printing press, we have the film camera, we have even glass blowing. And we hope to extend that tradition by building tools that organize information, foster creativity, and preserve creativity. So whether it's about finding something new or making something new, Google's here to help. And there's no better example of this than generative AI. These models can generate text, code, audio, images, video, and so forth, which can have a big impact on unlocking creative potential. And I think one of the most important breakthroughs in the last year is models that give users control over this process. It's about control. It's no longer about generative models that can just generate a realistic picture. It's about being able to make something that you've created yourself with a text prompt or some other input. And I can't stress enough how important this control can be. Why? Well, because I'm sort of an artist myself. Um, my bachelor's degree, uh, uh, pretty rare for Google, is in English Lit, uh, creative writing. I moved into science later. I play guitar and piano. For the guitar geeks there, that is a right-handed guitar flipped upside down. I'm a lefty with an extra pick guard added. I'm not a professional at any of this, but it brings me great joy. So to me, it's essential that we be honest to the creative aspect of what we're doing. Technology should serve our need to have agency and creative control over what we do. There's always been interplay between art and technology, but generative models now are different than the electric guitar. That's because they can actually move us deeper into our creation process to help us compose, edit, and generate new raw materials. In turn, this gives us new ways to make art and music, which I'm very excited about. So let's start with some examples. I'd like to start with assistive writing. Last year, we introduced Lambda, a dialogue engine enabled to engage users on a number of topics. Then a few of us at Google started to wonder how we might use Lambda for creative writing. And this led to our research question. Could a dialogue engine like Lambda assist writers with storytelling or even generate new ideas to help us get through writer's block? And that research question became the inspiration behind our WordCraft Writers Workshop. We challenged a number of professional authors to write experimental fiction using Lambda as a tool. I thought the stories were great, and I hope you will too. We'll be releasing them along with our research paper soon. One clear finding was that using Lambda to write full stories is a dead end. It's a much more effective tool when it's used to add spice, a particular character, or to enhance an aspect of the story. We also learned that the user interface has to be right. The WordCraft tool you are seeing here was designed from the ground up to enable writers to interact with generative models. Think of it as a text editor with a purpose. Without it, it would be impossible for the writers to do their work. I'm really excited about the quality of the writing. I think you'll enjoy reading these stories as much as we did and learning how Lambda played a role in the creative process. I invite you to look at their work. You'll see six of them on this slide and you'll find more at this link. Now let's talk about code. We're also exploring how AI can assist in software development. Again, let's make the connection back to writing. Developing code is a lot like creative writing. And our Learning for Code project, more concretely, is ex exploring how to generate AI code suggestions by combining language models with code repositories. We tested this internally at Google by giving our developers single line and long line code completion. It's still in early days, but we've already seen an improvement in coding iteration time by 6%. Let's switch to audio now. Google recently introduced Audio LM, a framework that can generate high fidelity speech and music by continuing from a small audio sample provided by the user. This provides us with control over the output, making it much more than push button audio generation. Let's take a listen to this Audio LM clip. Right, 
One thing that excites me about Audio LM is that it doesn't require expert annotation. In this example, there was no need for a musical score. It continued the audio directly from the audio in the space of audio, and it can work with any audio clip you ask it to extend. The creative applications here are exciting to imagine. Now I'd like to dive into a topic that's probably most visible and popular, text to image models. To quickly set up context of how far we've come in five years, take a look at these AI-generated images from 2014, 2019, and now today. Earlier this summer, you were introduced to Imagine and Partee, two different models that both have an impressive ability to generate images from text prompts. These models take different approaches to text to image generation. Effectively, Partee is more about the text in text to image. It uses language modeling to generate an image directly, and turns out it's really good at listening to the prompt and making the right image. For example, here the prompt is a dignified beaver wearing glasses, a vest, and a colorful necktie. He's standing next to a tall stack of books in the library. And as you can see, the model captures that intent. Imagine is more about the image in text to image. The underlying technology, Diffusion, is good at generating images with ever-increasing resolution. The basic intuition here is that diffusion learns to generate structure from noise. So why two approaches? Because we never know when research wins will happen. We really don't know what's gonna work until we try. And we're very happy to have two teams try two different areas. This time it happened that both approaches worked really well. We're also working on creative new ways to use the core technologies developed in Imagine and Party. Our dream booth project is like a personalized photo booth. You choose the subject. In this example, I've selected an image of a corgi. Dream Booth lets me drop in the corgi Im image into almost any setting I can imagine, for example, in the Acropolis. Another recent breakthrough that I'm really excited about is that some folks in Google research took diffusion models and applied them to the task of 3D rendering. This is called Dream Fusion. What you're looking at here are 3D images rendered using diffusion and those 3D images can even be pulled into 3D software and animated. The last area I want to touch upon is text to video generation. It's surprisingly hard to generate videos that are both high resolution, that is spatially, the images look crisp, and are coherent in time. That is, the sequence of images that unfold makes, tells a coherent story. We have two complementary research approaches that tackle both of these. Imagine video and Fanaki. Imagine Video uses the same diffusion technique that's used, that's used in Imagine to create really crisp individual images that can be used to generate short videos. Fanaki, on the other hand, uses a language model that generates tokens over time, which allow the model to pull together a long-form, coherent story. But the real magic happens when you combine them. I'm excited to show you our first rendering of a super-resolution text-to-video generation a blue balloon stuck in the branches of a redwood tree. Camera pans from the tree with single balloon to the zoo entrance. Camera pans to the zoo entrance. Camera moves very quickly into the zoo. First person view of flying inside a beautiful garden. The head of a giraffe emerges from the side. Giraffe walks towards a tree. Zoom into the giraffe's mouth, of course. <laughs> Giraffe gets close to a branch and picks a blue balloon. A single helium blue balloon with a white string is flying towards a giraffe's head. Giraffe chewing with a blue balloon nearby. Camera tilting follow the single, following the single blue balloon flying away. I, I'm, I, I didn't build this. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I think this is amazing. I, think it's, I genuinely think it's amazing that we can talk about telling long form stories like this. What's exciting about this is that we can generate super resolution video from not just one prompt, but from a sequence of prompts, effectively giving us a new way of storytelling. Video generation is in its infancy. I'm particularly interested in better understanding how filmmakers, or even video storytellers, even maybe me, might make use of this technology. We're also thinking about creatively combining some of these things for everyone to experience. Earlier this year at Google I.O., we announced AI Test Kitchen. It's an app that gives people a place to learn about, experience, and give feedback on Google's emerging AI technology. Today I'm happy to announce that we're working on new AI Test Kitchen experiences featuring text-to-image generation. 
You can build themed cities and design monster characters, all using text prompts. These experiences will be coming soon to the AI Test Kitchen, but you can get the app now from the Play Store or the App Store and start using Lambda. Okay, let's take a step back. Generative AI models are powerful. There's no doubt about that. They have the potential to give us completely new level of expression and artistic control. But we also have to acknowledge the real risks that this technology can pose if we don't take great care, which is why we've been slow to release them. And I'm proud that we've been slow in releasing them. So obviously there are some issues here I want to discuss around toxicity, disinformation, and bias, which could lead to overall trust in our media and news. It should be clear to folks like journalists, we don't want to make it even easier to blur the distinction between what's real and what isn't. There are a lot of open questions related to how this technology will impact the professional lives of creative people. We want to be very careful in how we build data sets and user experiences. In terms of acting responsibly, our research teams have been actively integrating Google's AI principles into our work. We're focusing on three key areas. The first two are about control. We want to provide controls for generating media. For example, we want to minimize the generation of toxic or violent media. And we also want to provide users with control to do stuff they really like, to be really creative. There's a lot of work going on to create appropriate interfaces and user experiences in controlling these models. There's also the question of controlling this media once it's created and disseminated on the web. We want to be sure we can detect synthetic media. We've been working really hard across the board on that. For example, I'm happy to say that we've made some progress. In our audio, example, uh, sorry, in our audio LM work, we trained a classifier that can detect synthetic speech with nearly 99% accuracy. So we're going to continue to be working on these two forms of control. First, when, when media is created, it's created responsibly. And when the media is disseminated, we have ways to detect it. Finally, it's important that we engage with the communities to build for everyone. We want to continue to work with writers, artists, musicians, creators, to understand their needs and to understand how to build tooling that matters for the community. So to conclude, creativity is an important part of what makes us all human. I think it's important that we keep this in mind when we're building these AI systems. Now I'd like to turn it over to Zubin to talk about how we're advancing AI through language. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Zubin, and I lead the Google Brain team at Google Research. I'm thrilled to talk to you today about our research in AI and language. My personal journey in AI and language research started in the late 1980s. It was an exciting time to work in neural networks back then, but we were very limited in what we could achieve. For example, even though I was using one of the most advanced computers at the time, a connection machine that you can see here, it was nothing compared to what's available now. And it didn't help that the World Wide Web didn't even exist yet. Technology and AI has advanced a lot since then. At Google, helpful technology grounded in research is in our DNA. In fact, what began as a research paper about information retrieval would eventually become the foundation for Google search. We've come a long way since this paper, but our approach to research has been the same, to focus on groundbreaking research that can improve the lives of as many people as possible. There's no better example of this than our commitment to advancing AI through language. Language is at the heart of how we communicate with one another and understand the world around us. And that's why it's important for us to push the state of the art in language-based AI. Let's take our latest and most capable model, Palm, as an example. We announced it earlier this year at Google I.O. And since then, we've made significant progress in AI research building on Palm. For example, we introduced Minerva, an AI system that's built on Palm and trained on scientific papers. It has the extraordinary ability of solving complex math problems, some at the graduate level. It does this by learning to do symbolic and arithmetic reasoning 
by discovering patterns in thousands of published papers. We've also explored using Palm to make robots more helpful. A lot of today's robots exist in industrial environments and are coded for very specific tasks. To make robots more generally useful, we recently combined the natural language understanding capabilities of Palm with the real world capabilities of a helper robot. The result is Palm Seiken, a robot learning model that gives a robot the ability to execute complex and abstract tasks by tapping into the real world knowledge encoded in Palm. We've, we've expanded on this work recently by exploring how robots make sense of what they see through language and can even use that to generate their own code in real time. These examples show the pace of innovation today and how far we've come in such a short amount of time. If you take a look back at 2017, when Google developed the transformer, the world didn't know it then, but this model would become the foundation of nearly all of today's advanced models. This includes some of our most advanced language models, such as Palm, and even the generative AI models you just heard about from Doug. By continuing to make language a fundamental part of our AI research, our hope is that it will benefit everyone in more ways. As we look ahead at the next generation of models and their impact, it's important for us to, that they reflect the diversity of world languages. There are over 7,000 languages spoken around the world, but only a few are well represented online today. So if you're one of, uh, for example, the 100 million people who speak Swahili, uh, a language for which there is not a lot of text on the web, it can be very frustrating when technology doesn't work the way you need it to. If we want to provide AI-based language technology for the world, we need to make sure our models are also trained on representative content of the world. At Google I.O. this year, we announced support for 24 new languages in Translate, bringing the total to 133 used around the world. But even then, we know that this is not enough. To this end, I'm excited to announce the Thousand Languages Initiative, an ambitious research project to build a model that will support the top thousand languages of the world. To accomplish this, we'll be focusing on three important factors. First is multimodality. The way people access information and connect has changed since the early days of Google. They're moving from text to relying on other modes like speech. Our models have also come a long way since those early days too. Many are capable of processing language-based information directly across multiple modalities, such as speech and videos. To make our products even more accessible, it's important that we address interactions like speech and other modalities. To this end, I'm delighted to also announce that we're building a universal speech model that's trained on over 400 languages, the largest language model coverage seen in a speech model today. The second focus for us is to continue to engage the broader community. We recently announced support for nine more African languages on Gboard by working with researchers and organizations in Africa to create and publish data. To build on the universal speech model and feed future efforts like this, we'll continue to work directly with communities across the world. For example, in South Asia, we are actively working with local partners to eventually collect representative audio samples from across the region's dialects and languages. And we are spinning up similar efforts globally. We also want to engage with a broader research community. And we'll be publishing a paper in the coming months so our research colleagues can build on this project. 
Finally, we plan to improve our products like Gboard, YouTube, and Translate by increasing the number of languages these products support, making it easier for people to use technology in their native language and to find relevant content. This will be a multi-year journey, but this project will set a critical foundation for making language-based AI truly helpful for everyone. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Marion and James to talk about how building AI responsibly for society underscores everything we do. Thank you. Marion? Hello there, James. It's good to see you. Good to see you, and good to see everybody. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is James Manika. I'm a Senior Vice President for Technology and Society at Google. And um, in addition to just recently having joined Google 10 months ago, I've spent probably a, what feels like a lifetime around these technology and society issues, it, whether it's in business, in government, but also in academia. And in fact, I'm actually reminded when Zubin was mentioning what he used to do with the old computers. I did my, my PhD in AI and robotics at Oxford about 20 something years ago, but my very first paper that I ever published on neural networks was actually in 1992 when I was still an undergraduate at the University of Zimbabwe. So it's just striking, stunning to me just to see the amazing progress that's occurred. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here. And I'm Marianne Croak. It's good to see all of you. I'm a VP of engineering at Google and I lead the Research Center for Responsible AI and Human Centered Technologies. In that area, what we do is we conduct research and we develop methodologies and tools to ensure that AI systems are behaving or performing in a responsible way along dimensions like toxicity, bias, uh, safety, misinformation, and so forth. James, you've been here about nine months, I think, right? Um, what's the most exciting things that you've discovered since you've been here? Wow, I mean, th this has been so much fun for me. I mean, I, I think if I, if I think about what's been most exciting to me uh, since I joined Google, um, I guess I'm excited about all the amazing breakthrough research, some of which you've heard about, from generative models, but also multimodal uh, uh, systems, but increasing the increasing generality of these systems. And also mention all the amazing progress in the science, and we haven't even talked much about that here, from quantum AI to all the work in protein folding lives. So all of that is very exciting to me. But I think if I think about this particular moment, I think there are two or three things that just stand out for me, Marian. One is the work that we've just been talking about around language. Uh, I think the fact that you just heard from Zubin describing just the amazing progress in language, that's just stunning to me. I mean, the, the universal speech model that Zubin described and the Thousand Language Initiative is, is phenomenal. The other thing that also stands out to me is all the work uh, that touches what's happening with climate science. You heard about the flood forecasting and the wildfire work and so forth. The, what's interesting to me, Marion, about the, uh, particularly the flood forecasting work is the fact that we're now taking it to so many more places. I think we just added, I think, like 18 new countries. I think three big countries in Asia, but also about 15 countries in Africa where these things are going to make an enormous difference. So that's quite, quite excited, exciting to me. And then never mind all the creative work that uh, Doug was just describing about. I, I, that was never, that was just bra breathtaking to me. Uh, but, but, but Marion, you've been a amazing pioneering inventor over for a very long time. Uh, you probably feel jaded, but what's, what's stunning to you? What's amazing to you? Well, what you see? one of the things that we're doing in our organization and, and uh, along with Doug and Zubin is we're creating uh, and conducting research that creates the ability for people to have more control over AI systems so that they're actually collaborating with these systems as opposed to just defaulting to autonomous decision making by them. And so I think that's really spectacular. And then there's been a lot of work in terms of um, allowing AI systems to provide the capabilities to help people with accessibility challenges. So, you know, the inclusivity of that is, is, is quite amazing to me and important. However, as you know, AI carries a great deal of risk with it. 
Uh, I think that's exactly right. One of the things that I was doing even before I joined Google was to work at the National Academies of Arts and Sciences, but also the Academies of Engineering, to think about what are these important risks and challenges that we need to think through. And I think, at least in my mind, Marion, they tend to be of three or four categories. Uh, and I think we have to think about each one of them. On the one hand, we've got all the kinds of risks and challenges when these systems don't work as intended. So that's where you think about things like bias and toxicity and when they're not fully factual or grounded and kind of make stuff up. So you've got, we've got to think about those kinds of challenges. How do we address those? I think a second category of challenges are things, uh, challenges when, when, in fact, uh, challenges of what I call use and misuse. So even if the system works as intended, are we actually applying these systems? And by we, I mean both the developers of the technology, but also the users of the technology. Are we applying it in the right way, as intended, in ways that don't cause harm? And so the use and misuse challenges and risks, I think, are quite, quite important. I wrote a third category, which are often these systems have a lot of second-order effects or unintended consequences. One of the things I've spent a lot of time uh, researching over the years is the impact, for example, on the labor markets. Uh, on jobs and so forth. So we have to be thinking about these second order effect. But I'll also bring up one of the last point, if I may, Marion, which is, I think Zubin touched upon this uh, and even uh, others did too, which is, I think there's always a risk about how are we putting these systems out into the world? And uh, what are the incentives around that? I think there's quite an easy thing to rush into putting what are still research systems out into the world before we've thought about the consequences, fully understood the potential, as well as the risk. So I think this question of how we put these systems out into the world. So I'm actually curious, maybe Marion, you can talk about, given these kinds of issues, how are we approaching these things at Google? Yeah, so my, my organization, if you can think about it, is designed to bring the technical realization to the AI principles. And uh, these principles, will, we articulated them in 2018. And I'm really proud of the fact that the principles actually put users and the avoidance of harm and safety above what are traditional business considerations. And you know, I think if we're going to be leaders in AI, it's extremely important that we really push the state of the art on responsible AI technology, and not just on plain AI technologies. And so, you know, I don't want the principles just to be words on paper. As you said, I am a lifelong inventor, and I, I love, you know, theory, but I'm passionate about fixing things and, and wanting to discover ways to make things work in practice. So some of the ways that we put the AI principles into practice is we do adversarial testing constantly and continuously. And then we also um, make sure that we're setting benchmarks that are quantitative and can be measured and verified across all the dimensions of our AI. And so we also do that on a continuous basis. We also try to improve models with advanced research techniques like uh, parameter efficient tuning that allows for more adaptability and agility. And then, you know, within the organizations itself, what we try to do is have a very diverse set of researchers, those from the social scientists, from uh, ethicists, from human rights experts, as well as AI and ML scientists. And then we, we also encourage a lot of community participation, as Doug talked about earlier as well. And so I think one of the, the visions that I have and that I think we will realize um, very soon, if, you know, within, within a few years, is to embed all the capabilities of responsible AI deep within the technical infrastructure that supports the models so that by default, you know, from an end-to-end -end perspective, when you're doing the data collection, when you're doing the design, when you're doing the testing and training of these models and then to the deployment and even out to monitoring them, you have RAI, which is responsible AI, just baked into the system. And, and Marion, what, what, what's, a, what's an example of a, of a practical tool that you can describe for how we actually put all this into practice? 
Well, one of the tools that we've created that I'm really excited about is called the Language Interpretability Tool, or LIT. Um, and what that does is it gives researchers this visual understanding of how their models are behaving. So it uses like st state-of-the-art technologies like salience maps and um, influence methods to allow researchers to answer questions like, why did my model generate that prompt? You know, um, and if the, if the response is problematic, what led to that behavior? And then what, what might happen if I cause different inputs to change? What might happen to the behavior of the model? And most of all, it allows, it gives researchers the opportunity to improve their models by using new technologies and methodologies. So, um, you know, I think it's very, very important that we open source models like that, and we have. Tensor, I mean, I'm sorry, Lit is available on platforms like TensorFlow, JAX, and other platforms for everyone to use. So, you know, I think these tools are critical and very important. You know, I think what one of the things, areas that's been on many people's minds is how we make systems like Lambda, you know, any of these very large models kind of uh, responsible and safe to use. Can you take us behind the scenes a little bit, describe what actually happens uh, behind the scenes on Lambda to make it, to try to make it safe and and, and, and Yes. Avoid yeah, Lambda is a very complex model. And um, so we've done the full responsible AI analysis on it. And we're still continuing to do it. Um, so we first start with risk and harms assessments. And these are done by AI ethicists, the same ones that help create the AI principles. And we use those risk and harms that, you know, they vary across toxicity and misinformation and bias and all the dimensions of, of responsible RAI. And we use those to create objectives, which we can quantify and measure. And, and then we are, what we do with that is we then collect data and we turn that data into conversations. And I'm going to use safety as an example for this conversation. So we, as we generate conversations, we either label them as safe or unsafe. And we have a diverse set of raters you know, labeling them. Human raters. Human raters, exactly. And then we feed that information, that data, into the model. And using ML, we then create safety classifiers in, in this example. And then we run the model again with the safety classifiers on, and we create just safe responses. And then we continuously collect data and feed it into the model so that we can have a more nuanced perspective of what is safe and unsafe. And so, you know, Lambda presents a number of challenges, and I can just tell you about a couple of them. One of them is around radar diversity. So we go out of our way to make sure that, you know, we're, we're using raters that are diverse in terms of their demographics as well as their perspectives, and we get disagreements, which is what we want. But then what typically happens is we lose the richness of those disagreements by coming up with a normative standard across them. So the industry as a whole is facing this problem as to what to do with the, you know, the valuable data that you get from diversity and how do you use that in a, in a constructive, positive way. The other thing that we've learned from Lambda is that classifiers have their limitations. So that, you know, we can create, we can say in a very dogmatic way, this is safe, this is unsafe. And that sometimes can take out the the beauty, almost, of the model. And you come up with a very, dis, just a brute force approach that where you lose the, uh, the fullness of, of what people are trying to actually do. And it becomes very dull and unimaginative. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we have a more refined perspective on classifiers um, so that we don't 
you erase things that are important. Let me just you know, give you a, a simple example. In many cultures, and one that I come from, the word dope can mean something that's very complimentary. So she's dope or he's dope is actually a compliment. If we use our toxicity filter, that would just get erased. And so many cultural idioms like that can, can you know, just be wiped out if you use, if you over constrain classifiers. So we're trying to strike this very delicate balance between having things safe and fair and also allowing for the richness in, in our society and other societies. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're describing with that example, there's actually quite a lot of academic research on this topic about how do we think about curating these data sets and these kind of toxicity measures. It's an ongoing journey. But I'm also curious, Marian, you've been working on this at Google and before. For, uh, is there an example of, of something that you think we got wrong mm -hmm. and we actually learned something from it? And what did we learn? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I think uh, one thing that we have learned is that genitive models tend to make up answers occasionally. They'll make things up. And we have to, you know, we've been doing very active research in order to improve the models and to mitigate against that by having factuality, classifiers, and filters. And we're doing active research to make sure that the responses are aligned with factual sources. And, and you know, uh, you've just been describing some of the work you do to get this right, but is there an example of an, a responsible AI innovation you're excited about where we actually figured out a way to be responsible in a very innovative yeah, and interesting way? Yeah, one of the things I'm most excited about that's going on in our organization right now is we've invented this tool that we can put on top of Lambda that will allow people who are not familiar with AI or ML, um, but are developers, to develop their applications, their AI-based applications. It's almost like a web-based interface into a very complicated model like Lambda, but you don't have to have all the expertise that someone like you would have in order to develop applications. So I, I'm very excited about that. Macromaker, I mean, I've actually used it a lot. Yes, actually, yes. But, but uh, well, one, of the, one of the other responsible AI innovations that um, uh, I've actually been stunned by since I joined Google is the work you and your team and others did on the Monk scale. I don't yes. know if people are familiar with that, which is one of the issues, for example, in images uh, is the ability to fully recognize the full spectrum of humanity. Uh, people like me, people of different colors. And I think there's been, historically, there was something called the Fitzpatrick scale, which has been used since like 1973, which only took into kind of very narrow range of, for example, skin tones. So I think uh, Google did some research, I think, with the researchers at Harvard to create the Monk scale, which is a much, much more expansive range of skin tones that actually covers all of humanity. And I think uh, this was announced at I.O. Yes, and it is was. now in open source. I thought yes. that was pretty pretty stunning as, a, as an interesting kind of responsible AI uh, in, 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 in innovation. But, uh, but, but two, I wanted to say a couple other things, though, which go beyond what we've discussed so far, Marion, which is uh, clearly, you know, it, this is a journey. Uh, as we tackle these issues and address some of them, new questions come up. So the responsible AI uh, considerations are really a journey. At the same time, that journey needs to keep up with the advancement of the technology itself. And it seems to me that, in fact, this is something we all have to collectively tackle. So it's not just the developers and the researchers, uh, but also, ultimately, the users, uh, whether they're companies and organizations, uh, or even governments, for that matter, the users of these technology, as well as the regulators. So I'm actually quite excited by the fact that, you know, uh, Google's a place that actually embraces uh, regulation That's because right. these technologies are far too important uh, not to regulate for all the reasons we just discussed. But it seems to me that even as we regulate, we have to think about how do we, how do we get this right? And I'd, I'd like to test at least my view of uh, getting it right with to hear your, your take on this, Marion, which is, you know, and this came out of some other work that I was doing even before Google, which is the idea of getting AI right seems to me to have two parts to it. 
One part is how do we actually make sure we are building the most useful, most beneficial AI capabilities and making sure that they're actually available to everybody. That seems to me to be an important part of getting this right. At the same time, how do we also tackle these complexities and risks and challenges? So it feels like getting it right is kind of getting both things right. I don't know if you agree with that. No, I, I absolutely do agree. I mean, AI is a foundational technology and it can have immense social benefits. And as we heard from Doug, it can unleash all this creativity. But because it has you know, such a broad impact, right, to help people, the, the risk involved can also be very huge. And uh, if, if we don't get that right, I mean, it almost doesn't matter that it provides so many benefits because it can be very destructive. So I think the two, you know, together are absolutely important. I also think the fact that we're working with outside experts outside of Google, and community participants who are, you know, very familiar with the impact that it may have on their different, the societies that they live in is hugely important. Working with policymakers is important because we want to make sure that the policies that they're adopting we can actually put into real technical use. So, you know, I, I, I think you're exactly right that this is going to take a village to get right and to, to do it well. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been fun uh, yes. having this conversation with you. And I think we're now going to take this back to, to Zubin. Zubin for closing, yes. Thank you. Today we talked about how we're committed to making AI work for everyone and doing it responsibly. Success here could mean everything from new ways to address societal challenges to enhancing human creativity to making communication more accessible for people around the world and so much more. It's AI that is built to help. We've come, we have a long way to go uh, but we're excited about the journey ahead. Thank you for joining us at AI At.